Good evening. I'm David Cataforis, Professor and Chair of Art History at the University of Kansas. I would like to acknowledge that the University of Kansas resides on the ancestral territory of the Kaw people, who were forced off their land by the United States in the 19th century and largely relocated to Oklahoma. This acknowledgement recognizes Native Americans as traditional guardians of the land and the enduring relationship between Native peoples and these traditional territories. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Murphy Distinguished Alumni Lecture, which is made possible by the Franklin D. Murphy Lecture Fund. I'm delighted to introduce our honored speaker, Dr. Mark Andrew White, who is Executive Director of the New Mexico Museum of Art. I will refer to him as Mark since he's my friend and colleague and my and Charles Eldridge's former student, as well as a student of others in our department. Mark is an Oklahoma native who earned his BA in art history from Oklahoma State University and his MA and PhD from KU. He defended his dissertation from dynamism to objectivity, the late career of George Bellows in 1999. From 1998 to 2000, he was curator of exhibitions at the Edwin A. Ulrich Museum of Art, Wichita State University. He then served on the art history faculty at Oklahoma State University from 2000 to 2008, where his research was supported by a Georgia O'Keeffe Museum and Research Center Fellowship and a Davidson Family Fellowship at the Amon Carter Museum. In 2000, Mark returned to the curatorial ranks as the Eugene B. Atkins Senior Curator and Curator of Collections at the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art at the University of Oklahoma. He was promoted in 2015 to that museum's Wyla Dean and Bill Saxon Director and Chief Curator. He assumed the Executive Directorship of the New Mexico Museum of Art in May 2020, and happily he's going to be able to reopen their museum this weekend. Mark organized numerous exhibitions at the Fred Jones Museum many accompanied by publications. They include Art Interrupted, Advancing American Art and the Politics of Cultural Diplomacy, Macrocosm, Microcosm, Abstract Expressionism in the American Southwest, A World Unconquered, The Art of Oscar Bruce Jacobson, Picturing Indian Territory, 1819 to 1907, and OKLA, OK about which he will speak today. As chief curator, he reinstalled 40,000 square feet of exhibition space in 2019, presenting a new thematic and chronological layout of the museum's collections. He successfully applied for major exhibition development grants from the Henry Luce Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, and the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, among others. In 2016, he secured a $750,000 award from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to support programs furthering the study of Native American art at the Fred Jones Junior Museum and the OU School of Visual Arts. One of the things I really admire about Mark is that alongside his administrative and curatorial work, he's been consistently productive as a scholar, publishing widely in both museum catalogs and academic books and journals, and giving public lectures at prestigious venues, including the Art Institute of Chicago and the National Gallery of Art, and papers at major conferences, such as the American Studies Association and the College Art Association. We're pleased and proud to welcome him back to KU remotely to deliver his lecture from OK to LA and back again. And before I turn the program over to Mark, I wanna let you know that he will take questions after his talk. So please type your questions into the chat on YouTube. And I'll uh, invite Mark to join us now. All right. Well, thank you, David. That was a very kind and generous introduction. Um, I want to thank Dr. David Cataforis uh, and the rest of the faculty at the Crest Foundation Department of Art History for their uh, generosity in offering me this opportunity to speak with you all tonight. Uh, it's a great honor to be recognized by one's alma mater in such a way. Um, many of the accomplishments of my career owe a significant debt uh, to the education I received at the University of Kansas. And um, really, I wouldn't be where I am today without their support, not only as a student, but as a professional afterwards. Um, so uh, thank you to all of them. And uh, thank you to those of you that have tuned in tonight to, to watch this lecture. Um, I hope what I have to say tonight will meet with your expectations, um, whatever they may be. So, um, my talk tonight, and I think I will start sharing my screen. 
Okay. Um, my talk tonight will focus on the exhibition um, OKLA, OK which I began and completed as director of the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art at the University of Oklahoma prior to taking my current position at the New Mexico Museum of Art. The project began in 2015 uh, with the exhibit finally coming to fruition when it opened in um, September of 2020. The talk that I'm going to give tonight um, is an interesting, sometimes convoluted story of creating an exhibition, working with six living artists who saw the project not merely as an exhibition of their work, but also as an autobiographical history of their friendships and professional relationships over the last 60 years. While I hope that I will share some interesting scholarly insights on the exhibition and the works of art that are included in that exhibition, um, I also wanna share a number of anecdotes related to the creation of, the, of this project since it became for the artists a kind of homecoming. Uh, for me, the exhibition became an examination of their, the role their Oklahoma upbringing played in their collective contribution to contemporary art not only in Southern California, but one would argue nationally and internationally, especially where key developments in both pop and conceptual art are concerned. Um, the exhibition was also of interest to me for their shared history, um, which included a number of collaborative projects, inside jokes, parallel interests, um, and I'll talk about many of them over the course of the career. Um, more pointedly, and this is where I really got interested in the subject matter, I was interested in the common sensibility that kind of tied them together, you know, because not only are they friends um, for uh, the majority of their lives, um, certainly going back to their elementary school days, um, but also the commonality. Uh, between their works, a kind of literalness or uh, unpretentiousness in the way that they have approached uh, their respective work. Um, there's also a, a humor, um, a, a, a sense of, of testing the boundaries of decorum uh, in a lot of their work, um, something that is intended to subvert or challenge public expectations. And that goes all the way back um, really to their high school days. One of the stories that Ed Ruscha tells about his friends, Jerry McMillan and Joe Good, is that he was drawn to art because they were always having so much fun in art class um, because they would make little sculptures and then set them on fire. Um, or at one point, Jerry and Joe, in, when they were working with clay, would roll it up into balls and throw it out of the window of the art class onto the window of an armored truck that had driven up. And the driver would get out and look around, trying to figure out where that clay was coming from. And Ed thought that was hilarious. And that's why he wanted to be an artist, um, was because he enjoyed that sense of camaraderie, but also that sort of challenge to uh, decorum, to convention, uh, to public expectations. So it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic that develops between these guys. Um, now, one of the reasons that I was drawn to this project initially, before I even really had the opportunity to meet the six artists, um, was partly because of the trajectory I'd been taking since I went back to Oklahoma in the early 2000s. Shortly after the award of my PhD in 1999, I took a position at Oklahoma State University as a professor of art history. And like many newly minted academics, I was looking about for my next scholarly project. Although I'm from Oklahoma originally, I only then became aware that there was little scholarship on artists who worked in the state, apart from a few and relatively brief exhibition catalogs. Although a number of Oklahomans had made national reputations, um, people like Lee Mulligan, Leon Polk Smith, um, Ed Ruscha, of course, uh, Marjorie Strider, uh, the relationship of Oklahoma to their work had often been minimized. So I began at, at Oklahoma State to research Oklahoma artists in earnest with the intent of raising the profile of these artists within the state while also demonstrating that Oklahomans were by and large conversant in national and international trends. Um, this approach struck me at the time as the cultural equivalent of buying local. Um, after all, so many of us, we want our food sourced locally. We wanna support local businesses, 
but we often look to the coasts or abroad for culture. And so I wanted to see what Oklahoma had to offer. And I felt that if Oklahomans didn't take their art seriously, well, certainly no one else would. And so we had to begin um, as sort of a grassroots movement, I, I guess you could call it. Um, so when I then moved to the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art in 2009, many of the projects that I began tried to put Oklahoma and its artists in that broader context. And I just wanted to bring in two of those, those projects that I consider among my favorites. Uh, one is Oklahoma Modern, the art and design of Alinka Hurdy, um, who is a relatively unsung modernist from Oklahoma, but um, fascinating in what she was in the, the brand of abstraction that she was producing in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and as David mentioned, macrocosm, microcosm, abstract expressionism in the American Southwest, uh, which attempted to demonstrate um, that there was in fact a really strong interest in abstract expressionism in the American Southwest and that in some ways the Southwest became a kind of crossroads between New York City and San Francisco. Um, the story of the exhibition uh, begins arguably with the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art's acquisition of the painting you see on the screen Ed Ruscha's No Man's Land from 1990. Um, no Man's Land is um, a large painting, as you can tell, 54 by 120 inches. Um, and it is one of the few overt um, examples of the state of Oklahoma informing Ruscha's career. In the upper left, you see the outline of the state of Oklahoma, but the vast majority of this grayish field is taken up by a large question mark, a motif that Ruscha was using quite a bit in the 1990s. Um, no Man's Land is a title that refers actually to the panhandle of, of Oklahoma. Um, when Oklahoma was being settled during a succession of land runs, uh, thereby pushing native populations onto reservations and transforming it from Indian territory into Oklahoma territory, the panhandle was not really part of that discussion. It was often referred to as No Man's Land because it belonged to God, but no man, uh, because at the time, no one really wanted to settle there. Um, Ed really likes No Man's Land uh, as a title, but he also likes the Panhandle as a place to visit. Um, he often goes out on drives and he would visit the Panhandle frequently upon returning to Oklahoma from, from Los Angeles. But it also refers to Ed's youth um, when he began to hitchhike. Uh, as a teenager in the 1950s, he began to wonder what was beyond the borders of Oklahoma, and he and his friends would go hitchhiking. Um, and so No Man's Land is also a reflection on what was beyond that youthful experience. You know, what was it that he could find in the United States? And that develops a, a um, lifelong wonderlust in Ed Ruscha's life. Um, it develops um, into a fascination with cars and car culture um, that really persists to this day. So to go back to the acquisition of the painting, um, we began a campaign to acquire this painting in uh, 2012. And eventually the museum succeeds with a partial gift from Ed and Dana Ruscha in 2013. Um, so this was a major acquisition for us. It's the only major Ruscha painting in the state of Oklahoma. And so that begins the, a sequence of events. Um, there you see uh, Ed in the lower left with his brother, his younger brother, Paul. And then uh, I thought as contrast, I'd bring in the youthful portrait of them in the upper right, uh, the two handsome devils there with their caricatures that they had gotten. Gosh, I think Paul said it was in Santa Monica or something like that. So uh, anyway, um, it is through the acquisition of that painting that I first met um, Paul. Now, the Ruchets are of course from Oklahoma City. Um, their parents began to, their parents moved there when Ed was, I think, hmm, two or maybe four. Paul wasn't born yet. So Paul was actually born in Oklahoma City. 
Um, but of course they set their sights elsewhere and both Ed and Paul now live in Los Angeles, but their sister Shelby remains in Oklahoma City and they often come back to visit Shelby and to see many of their friends. So it was on one of Paul's return journeys um, that I was invited to uh, go have a couple of drinks to meet him and um, hang out with a couple of mutual friends. And as Paul and I began to talk, we realized that we had a very similar interest in, um, in the art of Oklahoma. After all, Paul was also an Oklahoma artist at one point in his career. So we began to talk about that in, in sort of loose terms, but not with a project in mind. It then came to sort of um, a head when Ed Ruscha was given the Oklahoma Governor's Art Award in 2015. And when Ed was in town, Paul wanted to bring him by the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art, not only to see No Man's Land installed, but to see the exhibit in general. And so in the lower right, you have a photo of Ed, um, our director of audience development at the time, Jessica Kinsey, who's now the director of the Southern Utah Museum of Art. And then what could be, if not the worst picture of me, certainly in the top five. I, I don't know what is going on with my head there. I promise you it is not that big and fat. Um, I don't know if any of you remember the uh, old um, Kids in the Hall commercial, I'm crushing your head. Looks like somebody started to crush my head, but then decided it wasn't worth the effort. Um, anyway, moving on. So as part of that, um, as part of that meeting with Ed, he decides that he wants to give us a lot of his personal collection. Um, now I say a lot, but that's relatively speaking. Ed has a, a huge collection. Um, he, if he wasn't an artist, he'd be a hoarder. Um, but you know, he, he hoards good things. So I guess it's okay. Anyway, um, so Ed collects a lot and he wanted us to have a significant, um, a significant portion of his collection based around his friends from Oklahoma. So that included works of his, like the work you see in the lower right, uh, signed from 1960, which was one of his early collages. Um, it, it, they, they sort of anticipate what he will do in the early 1960s um, because he becomes very interested in signs, signification, but it also demonstrates his interest in the found object and data collage. Um, Ed, like many of the other guys that I'm gonna talk about, is a big fan of Marcel Duchamp, knew Marcel Duchamp, and um, Duchamp will kind of shape many of their early careers. That would include his good friend Joe Good, also from Oklahoma City. Uh, you see on the left one of the works that Ed gave us by Joe. This is part of a extensive series of, of uh, Sumi-E drawings that Joe did depicting Oklahoma tornadoes. Um, he found a book at the airport, uh, a book by um, Gary England, a famous meteorologist. He actually has a bit part in the old movie, well, I say old, it's not that old, the movie Twister from the, from the early 1990s. And Gary England had written this, this kind of, um, you know, popular book about tornadoes called something like Those Terrible Twisters. Well, Joe bought it at the airport and he gets really interested in the subject. And he had had a history by this time of depicting environmental subjects, one of the really fascinating tendencies in his career that really deserves more attention. And it was also at that time that he met his current wife um, who has a paper making business in Los Angeles. And she makes uh, washi, Japanese paper in the traditional fashion. And so Joe begins using sumi ink and washi paper to create these images of Oklahoma tornadoes. And he sort of bridges the, um, the sort of uh, element of chance that one finds in Sumi-E, especially when using washi paper, with the capriciousness or unpredictability of tornadoes. And so there is a subtle uh, element of chance, a subtle element of chaos in all of these drawings um, in the actual process itself. And beyond that, they're really just gorgeous. Um, we this is one of the uh, objects that's also in OKLA. And um, if you ever get a chance to see these, they're, not, they're often very large, 
um, but they they really do beg a lot of um, a lot of um, close inspection. Also, as part of that gift uh, was the work of Jerry McMillan, another of his fellow Oklahomans and friends. Um, and this is also in OKLA. Um, Jerry is best known as a photographer, uh, but the work that Ed gave us is one of the sculptures that Jerry began in the early 1970s. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail later on, but Jerry as a photographer began questioning why photographs had to be flat. Uh, in the 1960s. And he begins to flirt with the idea of translating photographic imagery into three dimensions, but then he often will translate it back into two dimensions. So he begins to play with um, the sort of, of subtle transition from 2D to 3D, which as you'll see later on is also an interest that Joe Good has, has too. So this was a 1962 photograph that Jerry had taken of the LA skyline. You can see City Hall right there, which was at the time the tallest building in Los Angeles because of city ordinances. Um, it isn't until the late seventies or the early eighties that they allow skyscrapers to come into downtown LA. Um, but what then Jerry did is to flatten that photograph into a silhouette to etch it with copper um, and create a three-dimensional object out of the two-dimensional photograph. So it's, it's a really interesting um, transition and aesthetic interest in his work. But what was also compelling about this object is that it demonstrates the sort of fascination that not only Jerry, but Ed and the other guys had with LA it was a distinctly different environment from the Oklahoma Plains. Um, you had, for instance, palm trees. Uh, and Ed at one point talks about his desire to go to LA and he's the one that kind of begins the push that gets them all ultimately all to migrate there. He wanted to go to LA because he remembered it was warm and there were palm trees there. Um, so it was a pretty simple idea for Ed, a, simple, a pretty simple lure, but it was a fascination I think that brought all six of those guys uh, to LA ultimately. Okay, so those were some of the works that were included in Ed's gift. And with that gift, Paul and I began talking about doing a project that will really showcase what Ed gave us, but that will go beyond, that will, that will do something art historically significant around these six guys because in truth, that had never really been done. So let's talk about the movement of these artists from Oklahoma City to Los Angeles. So to begin with, um, Ed Roche decides that he wants to go to Los Angeles in 1956. So he gets in a car with his good friend, his, his school buddy, Mason Williams. Some of you may be familiar with Mason Williams. Uh, Mason is a Grammy award-winning musician, uh, folk musician primarily. He is a comedy writer. He is a writer and he is a sometimes artist. Um, and the two decide to go and find their fortune in Los Angeles. Initially, Ed is wanting to go out to go to um, um, the art school center which uh, the art school center is, was at that time and still kind of remains a design school. But at that point it was very much an industrial design school. And Ed thinks that he's actually gonna go and design cars or staplers or anything else. He actually wants to work with physical practical objects, but he can't get in, it's full. So instead he decides to go to the Chouinard Art Institute, now Cal Arts. And when he gets there, he meets another individual. And I just wanna use the photograph here as reference. So here's Ed Ruscha. He meets Patrick Blackwell, um, also from Oklahoma City, though they didn't know each other previously, and Pat's friend, Don Moore. So they decide to get a house together. That is Ed, um, Pat, and Don. They're joined at that point by another artist from St. Louis, uh, Wall or Wally Batterton. Um, so they're all attending Chouinard Art Institute. Ed, on a trip back to Oklahoma City, convinces Jerry, who you see right here, to come out and go to Chouinard. Jerry had been flirting around with going to various schools, including, by the way, the Kansas City Art Institute. And uh, at one point, he considers going to work for Hallmark. But he decides, no, 
I really want to be with with my friends. So he joins he joins Ed at the Chouinard Art Institute, and then um, in 1957 they go to the Chouinard Ball which um, was a, an annual costume ball. And they dress up as five beggars um, using as rags these curtains that one of their classmates had given them that they all hated. Um, so they go as these five beggars and they win the cash prize. And they decide, okay, what are we gonna do with this cash prize? We're going to create a business for ourselves. We're going to become the students five. So they take out an ad in the art press, broadly speaking, for design work. And they begin to get inquiries, people asking them to do things. Um, so at that point, they become known as the students five. Okay, so the reason I mentioned this, and I, I did warn you that this would be a little convoluted, so stick with me. So the reason I mentioned the students five is that when Paul and I begin talking about projects, Paul says he wants to bring the students five back together. And I say, okay, that's a great idea. The problem is that no one knows what had happened to Don Moore. And for me, I wanted it to have a very Oklahoma centric focus, which meant that Wally Batterton didn't quite fit in terms of, of the major part of the exhibition. You know, at, at best he could be kind of ancillary to the story. So that leaves, of course, the four artists that you see here in the photograph, Joe Good, Jerry McMillan, Ed Ruscha, and Pat Blackwell. I think I neglected to mention that Joe Good shows up in 1958, um, a couple of months later after uh, Jerry joins. So these are four artists. They're going to Chouinard. They're living in a house together on New Hampshire Avenue in Los Angeles in a house that no longer exists. Now there's a, a apartment complex there. And, um, but they're still known as the Students Five. So Paul wants to put this back together. I want to broaden it. So I say, okay, Paul, how about this? We add you as Ed's younger brother, but also you lived in the house with him for some time, but also Mason Williams, because Mason is part of this, this broader story. And that's where the exhibit begins to go. So I want to say a few words about their experience at Chouinard, because it will also set the trajectory of their career and it will inform other things that I want to say about some of the works uh, that I've mentioned. Um, first of all, um, you know, they're studying under uh, instructors like Emerson Wolfer and uh, Robert Irwin, who can they, they consider both an instructor and a friend. And um, Irwin in particular will encourage them to do kind of whatever they want to do as long as they are acting creatively. And it leads them all to explore and to break out of what was the dominant style at the time, abstract expressionism, especially as it was taught by Emerson Wolfler. So let's talk about the individual artists and how they do that. I'm gonna show a lot of photographs by Jerry McMillan because he becomes kind of the chronicler of this group. And in some ways, much of the Southern California scene. Um, you see, here, Jerry's photograph of Patrick Blackwell. Uh, this is titled The Patrick Blackwell Mailer, Looking for a New Position in the Advertising World from 1962. And um, Pat was, after he had graduated from Chouinard, trying to go into advertising. He ultimately gets a job at Carson Roberts, one of the major advertising firms in Los Angeles, where also Ed Ruscha works for a brief time. Ed actually starts his career not as a artist, but as a designer, until he decides he didn't really like it but that does inform his decision to go into books. Um, and so Pat wants a photo to attach to his resume. At the time, the dominant trend was to emulate the example of Irving Penn. Um, you know, these kind of very nice, stylish, sleek black and white photographs, like the one you see in the lower right, uh, Frederick Kiesler and Willem de Kooning, but they decided they didn't wanna do that at all. So what they did was they piled the contents of Pat's studio into Jerry's Volkswagen bus. They hauled it over to, um, no, I'm sorry, it was Pat's Blackwell 
It's Pat Blackwell's book, so I can bust. Not that it matters, but anyway, they put it all into his bus. They throw it into Jerry's studio and create this sort of autobiographical image of anything and everything that mattered to Pat at the time. Photos of his wife and daughter, um, design projects, things he had picked up at the time. Um, and it actually sets a trend in, in Southern California for the sort of whimsical, creative artist portraits. And Jerry, in that fashion, becomes the chronicler of the Southern California scene, probably culminating in one of his best known photographs, uh, the image of Judy Chicago in the boxing ring that announced the change of her name to uh, Judy Chicago from uh, Judy Garowitz. Now, Pat um, will spend much of his career working as a designer, but there are a couple of objects, art objects in the exhibition, like, for instance, this painting of his getting around the Emerald City, where he seems to um, take a cue on one hand from abstract expressionism using the drip, the gestural stroke, um, but also the serial repetition that one might connect with, with Andy Warhol. Um, getting around the Emerald City is a joke based on his new license plate, uh, which is Oz 3211. Um, he wants us to in invite us into that kind of, of formal joke. Um, but the serial repetition, for him also, I think, very much connected to his design career. You know, he knew the, val the value of repetition. Uh, and so he will explore that throughout his career, not only as a designer, but also as an artist when he was able to um, find time to work in painting or in print. Um, another figure that is, uh, a prominent member of this group, but um, also a, a prominent uh, voice in the exhibit is Joe Good. Um, so Joe Good, and you see Jerry's uh, photo in the right, uh, which is titled Joe Good in front of his studio on Western Avenue, standing below a sign left by a previous tenant. Joe left it up. So Joe had a studio for a long time that seemed like a kind of evangelical fundamentalist church. And um, I guess people used to stop by on Sunday wanting to potentially attend and he would just show up at the door and wonder why they were there. But that's very much Joe's personality. Um, Joe comes to prominence in the 1960s with the painting that you see in the upper left, and this is also in the exhibit, Happy Birthday from 1962. Um, one of the reasons it became so prominent is that uh, it was featured on the cover of Art Forum that same year because at the time Ed Ruscha was doing some of the layout for Art Forum. Um, but Happy Birthday is a fascinating object. Um, it is part of his arguably best known work, the uh, Milk Bottle series. You see the large uh, sort of, of color field type painting, although that's, I think, not an appropriate characterization of it, um, with an actual milk bottle sit sitting in front of it, painted using the same color on that canvas, although obviously because it's been applied to the glass milk bottle, it appears darker. Um, as Good had recalled, he had returned from his night job to see empty bottles from the Altadena dairy on the porch waiting to be retrieved by the milkman. And um, they had this milk service, he and his wife, Judy Winans, who was an interesting artist in her own right. Uh, they had this milk service because they had just had um, a new daughter. And so Joe decides to initiate this series. He paints Happy Birthday for his daughter, but his interests are less about sentimentality than about the formal dynamics of the three-dimensional and the two-dimensional. Um, he places the, the Altadena bottle, which has been painted, of course, using the same paint on the canvas, in front of a large canvas that's uniformly painted pale pink with a subtle horizontal line that delineates the lower eighth of the canvas of the surface. Now the horizontal deviates, as you can see in the center, uh, around a square, uh, in a kind of a squared projection around the contour, the drawn contour of that milk bottle. Um, in fact, it emulates the shadow that that milk bottle casts on the canvas. And if you line the lights up in just such a way, the shadow perfectly fills that contour. Um, what Joe is interested in obviously is collapsing those distinctions between the real and the illusory. Um, between 
what are the accepted notions of painting, especially under abstract expressionism, and what painting could become in the 1960s by incorporating the found object. Um, and I would say that a, a work like this really does have a lot of connections to the work of Robert Irwin, um, who was at this time experimenting with discs and light and the influence of light and shadow and how it helped construct a sense of real space. Um, I also want to say that Joe was very much influenced by his friendship with Marcel Duchamp, who had taught him the importance of the found object. Um, and Joe will continue to use the found object in a variety of ways, often mundane, fabricated, mass-produced objects um, that are part of our daily existence. And like Duchamp, um, Joe will use them in, in sort of an interesting fashion. Now that leads me to Jerry. Um, in the upper left, you see one of Jerry's sort of self-portraits. Um, this is Jerry McMillan photographed by Maurice Yanez while Jerry was photographing Maurice. So you actually see Jerry's friend, Maurice Yanez, in the mirror. And behind Maurice, you have photos of, of Maurice that Jerry took without Maurice knowing. So you've got a, an interesting exploration of space that one might compare to uh, Velasquez Las Meninas, in which you have an expansion of pictorial space well beyond what should be pictured. Um, and so Jerry begins to think about those, those interesting ideas of space and how he can break phot photography out of the sort of flat piece of paper. Um, how do you break out of the sort of reality of the two dimensions? And so when asking himself, why do pho photographs have to be flat? He'll begin a diverse series of photographic constructions. His first experiment was Patty as Container from 1963, in which he took a photograph of his wife and um, he took the gelatin silver prints, he scored them and wrapped them around a box, roughly the size of a toothpaste box, um, to not only expand the photograph into a three-dimensional object, into a construct, but also to make a subtle joke because Patty at this point is pregnant. And so just as Patty is on a container, Patty is a container um, and she is surrounded by other containers, many of them her ceramics from Chenard. Um, so Jerry is, is trying to create, you know, a sort of layering of meaning, but also an interesting investigation of space and this is one of the first instances in art history, Jerry would say it is the first, I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, of where, uh, where you see a photographic construction. Um, you know, so I hope for his sake that that's true because he's telling an awful lot of people that, but you know, if it's not, well, he was certainly among the first. Now, I also want to point out that the reason that Jerry was beginning to think about the photograph as an object is that this is this coincides with the first major exhibition of pop art in the United States, Walter Hopp's 1962 New Paintings of Common Objects, which had recently opened at the Pasadena Art Museum. Um, both Joe Good and Ed Ruscha were included in that exhibition. Jerry sadly was not, but he was inclined to think in terms of containers because not only do you have his friends Ed and Jerry there, but you also have people like Andy Warhol represented. Now that leads us to uh, Ed Ruscha and you see Jerry's photograph of Ed in the upper left from 1970, Ed Ruscha covered with 12 of his books because by that time Ed had become very well known for his books. Um, Ed got very interested in creating art books primarily because um, he had worked for a printer, he had worked as a layout artist, um, and this was a niche that just had always interested me, interested him, uh, but his books were unlike anything anyone had seen up to that point. Um, they were often um, collections of photographs of Subjects that one wouldn't think to photograph, like, for instance, his first book, 26 Gasoline Stations from 1962, 
Um, and at the time when Ed was producing these things, everybody was kind of amused by what he was doing. Um, as Robert Irwin sa said, the general response when you got a Ruche book was look through it with interest, then laugh, then look through it with interest. You kept looking for the story. Well, often there was no story. They were just what they were, a collection of images. Of course, now Ed has created this sort of, of um, interest in artist books that have, that continues to this day. But you know, at the time, it was, it was it was pretty much a singular creation. Now, it is actually actually one of those artist books, Twenty Six Gasoline Stations, that leads to one of his most famous motifs, the Standard Station. Uh, which I include here with the print standard station from 1966. Um, 26 gasoline stations included a photograph of a standard station in Amarillo, Texas. And it is that station that becomes that motif for him. In many respects, it, it uh, represents the banality of the original photograph, but with kind of a seductive streamlining comparable to the, steep, the sleek stylized approach of the advertising that he had been involved with in, in the 1960s. Um, and I wanna say that this is actually part of a suite of images and all, all of the images are in the show, but um, Ed begins to play with the standard image after people get fascinated by it as an object. It sort of takes away the banality of, of the subject that I think Ed really enjoyed. And so then he decides that he's going to take the standard station and make fun of it. So he begins to subject it to various things. At one point, um, he has it catch on fire. Um, but in the four suite of prints, he actually revisits the standard station in three other versions. One of them is a mocha standard, which is the image of a mocha. Uh, the other one is a cheese mold standard with olive in which it is the color of cheese with an olive carefully placed. And then the final version is actually a collaboration with Mason Williams, which is called double standard and has the standard sign represented twice. Now, I will also say that those, the, one of the reasons that um, I wanted to show the print and I wanted to include it in the exhibit is that Ed actually gets tired of painting in the 1960s. He prefers printmaking. And so there's a long period of time where he abandons painting altogether and prefers prints. Um, and that becomes one of his most um, prolific media in which to work. Um, it also allows him to work with different um, with different media, literally, and that's where he begins to experiment with foodstuffs. And I think one of the more interesting tendencies in Ed's career is where he begins to experiment with um, gunpowder, with ketchup, with um, chocolate, and various other foodstuffs as actual media for his works on paper. So, from there, I began to meet with all of the artists. I began to meet with Ed and Jerry and Joe to talk about the direction that this, this project was taking. Um, and it was, it was a, it, it quickly became clear that there were these commonalities that I kind of already addressed in, in some of the work, um, but that they all had this interest in, um, literalness. That is that the object that was represented is really what was of interest. It was not necessarily a metaphor. It was not intended to have great signification, um, but they were interested in it for almost kind of its face value. You know, Ed, for instance, always bristled when people in, asked him what his words meant. Um, you know, he would say, why do the words have to mean anything? Nobody asks an artist why they put this blue on this green. Well, that's not really true, but you know, that's what he said. Um, the same thing with Jerry, you know, he would say, um, what you see there is, is it's what's there. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot going on. Um, and Joe was probably the most plain spoken of all of them and would say, I come from a literal point of view. Um, and so pulling out those connections was very necessary. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to include the peripheral figures or the figures that were ne not necessarily part of that direct circle of friends. So that would include Mason Williams. Um, I mentioned Mason earlier in the talk because Mason was the individual that the friend that Ed went out to uh, California with originally. Um, 
Mason is best described as a folk musician with a sense of humor. Um, he is performing in clubs and Tommy Smothers of the Smothers Brothers sees his act and asks him to become their head writer for their upcoming television show on CBS, the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. And in that, Mason will regularly test the boundaries of decorum, the tolerance of the censors with a wide variety of sketches. Just for instance, for those of you that don't know the Smothers Brothers, I mean, it, uh, some of you are aware, but um, for those of you that haven't seen any of the episodes, because they don't appear on Comedy Central, they, they're not in reruns. Um, Mason created this, the character, for instance, of Goldie O'Keefe, uh, the hippie, which Goldie, which Goldie O'Keefe is a euphemism for marijuana, um, and it was played by Lee French. Originally, he wanted to call the character Mary Jane Roach, but the censors got a hold of that and, of course, wouldn't let them do it. So Goldie O'Keefe was a little bit more subtle and allowed Mason to sneak that one into the censors. Um, another great story, because I told you I was going to tell you some anecdotes. Um, he played an elaborate practical joke on the censors. At one point, um, because he knew that the censors were watching closely, he gets everybody on the cast and the set to use the term rowing to Galveston. Well, rowing to Galveston doesn't mean a thing, but every time somebody on the, would say on the set, rowing to Galveston, everybody would sort of chuckle with, you know, kind of um, salacious laughter. Well, eventually they work it into a sketch and the censors cut it. And Mason goes back to him, why did you cut that? Well, because, it, you know, it's a euphemism. And Mason says, for what? And of course, they have to admit that they don't know what the heck it means, but that, you know, everybody... Uh, erupted in dirty laughter every time they heard it. So it must be something dirty that is not proper for primetime television. Um, so Mason was always kind of trying to test the boundaries. Um, and that really is, I think, visible in this photograph that Jerry took, Mason Williams Sunrise downtown on 7th Street in Los Angeles, which was taken right at dawn because about 30 minutes later, this street becomes packed with cars. And Jerry was very concerned that uh, they were gonna be arrested anytime. But I also wanted to offer one of Mason's flirtations with the visual arts in the form of a video that was, um, that was showcased on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour in 1968. It's called 3000 Years of Art and it was a collaboration with the animator and video artist, uh, Dan McLaughlin. Dan McLaughlin originally creates this project as a film called God is Dog Spelled Backwards. And it features roughly 2,500 works of art in three minutes. Now, Dan McLaughlin had set all of that to um, Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 in C minor. But when Mason asked Dan to reuse this, this video, he wants to set it to classical gas, which at the time was Mason, one of Mason's best known musical um, compositions, and it would win him three Grammys in 1969. So I'm gonna show a little bit of this um, and David's gonna help me because for some reason I can't get the link to work. Well, I can't get the link to work. I can't get the sound to work in my, in my PowerPoint. So I'm gonna stop sharing and David's gonna bring up the video on his um, computer and we'll watch about the first 30 seconds of this. No, it seems we can't hear the sound. That's too bad. Let me try one more time. Okay, let's try this. Do you have it here now? Yes. 
that's probably pretty good. You get the idea, and it's available on YouTube um, if you want to watch all three minutes. Um, it is fairly entertaining. Um, let's see here. So let me share my screen again, and we will continue. So that appears, I mean, can you imagine that appears on um, national television in 1968? Um, can hardly imagine it happening now. Um, but also, I think a great teaching tool, also a great study tool if you're studying for your uh, master's exam, I have to say. So um, keep that one in mind. Uh, and then I am running short on time, so I'm going to try to hurry it up. I, I apologize. Um, but uh, apart from Mason, I also wanted to include Paul Ruscha since the project began with him. Um, Paul, Paul has always lived in the shadow of his brother, Ed, uh, because of course, Ed is recognized as a major artist uh, worldwide. Um, but Paul has, has um, created a number of objects in, over the course of his career. He's primarily a photographer today and actually works for Ed. But um, one of his earliest objects was, was this one on the lower right, Self-Portrait on Target from 1965. Um, Paul has always been very much influenced by both, Paul, by both um, Marcel Duchamp and by Dada. Uh, he has said that humor in the elbow of Dada in my ribs are what, have, are what have to be present for me to keep sane and interested in my eye on the target. Um, which is a not so subtle reference to this actual object. Um, it recalls obviously in some respects, the uh, work of Jasper Johns, uh, whose target with four faces from 1955 um, had been one of the ways in which uh, Neo Dada had started to create a break from abstract expressionism. Um, and as you know, um, Target with Four Faces includes uh, plaster portraits of Jasper Johns in the, up, in the upper register, but the target has also been interpreted various ways in terms of John's identity, his sexual identity specifically, and the fact that Jasper Johns uh, you know, felt that as a homosexual at the time, that he was perhaps a bit of a social target. Well, the same was, was the case for Paul. Um, Paul um, was at this point bisexual and um, was really kind of struggling with that identity and how it manifested in public situations. Um, so what he created is um, a box full of a number of personal accoutrements, including uh, a photo of him, uh, one of his, his wisdom teeth, etc. cetera. Um, it also obviously refers to the work of Joseph Cornell. And uh, Cornell was not only in interest of Paul's, but at this point, Cornell had become a, relative, a relatively new celebrity, art historically speaking, um, because Cornell had his first major exhibition at the Pasadena Art Museum also organized by Walter Hopps, and uh, that was in 1966. Um, we like to think of Cornell as being a major artist in art history for a good portion of the 20th century, but in truth, um, his public profile really does um, come to the fore in, in 1966. Um, another reference to Paul and his identity um, as he begins to move away from actual um, sculptural or painted objects and into photography, he begins to use himself as, as subject. Um, and that is certainly the case here in this photograph, Turkey Fever, which was shot by Michael Masterson, but was uh, staged by Paul and Paul is the subject. This appeared in Stuff Magazine in 1981. Um, this act object is a portrait of Paul's backside. Uh, which Michael had told him looked like a cooked turkey when he bent over. Um, it has, as a photograph, the appearance of one of a sort of straight photography, say Paul Strand, Edward Weston, uh, Imogen Cunningham. But really, Paul's inspiration was closer to Marcel Duchamp, uh, particularly a work like LHOQ, which, as you know, when you read it in French, translates to she has a hot ass. Well, in this case, Paul is showing his, his hot ass. Uh, 
And finally, I, I wanted to say that one of the, the pleasures of creating this exhibit was to work with Paul closely on the recreation of an object that he had created in 1969 originally in Oklahoma City. That object originally was called Dinner for Doris. Um, it was a tribute to Doris Day and the difficulty she was having in the press at that moment because her son had been the target of Charles Manson and the Manson family. Um, when Sharon Tate and the others were killed, um, it was because the Manson family was actually looking for Doris Day's son because Manson had felt that Day's son had more or less kind of uh, stolen a music contract from him and ruined his promising musical career. So what Paul wanted to do was to create a series of um, a series of place settings around toilets and that people who were in the press at the time in adversarial roles would be invited to that business, that dinner party, sorry. And so across from Doris Day, you would have, for instance, Charles Manson. So Paul revisits this in 2005 as Dinner for W in a reference to George W. Bush and people who were at odds in the media at that point. And then for this exhibit in 2020, he decides that he wants to restage it as dinner for Donald in reference, of course, to Donald Trump at the time, the president of the United States, now no longer. Sorry, I feel like I just have to say that. Uh, and you find at the table um, various people who are also at odds. So with Donald Trump, you have, for instance, Mitch McConnell, you have, um, I think I, you have Kellyanne Conway, you have Jimmy Kimmel, you have Nancy Pelosi. Um, and here you see the installation at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art with Paul sitting on one of the toilets. I should mention that periodically a recorder in the tank of each flushes. Now, just to conclude, um, this exhibit was a really fantastic project to work on. It allowed me to get close to these artists to explore something that they felt very strongly about. Um, they really, as I said early on in this talk, saw this as a homecoming, one in which they could return artistically and by extension of their work, come back home. Um, you know, Joe, I think, was, was probably the most vocal and said, you know, that he, before he died, really wanted to show in his hometown again. And this was a way for, for that to happen, um, to show these lifelong friends together in a way that they had not been shown together throughout the course of their career. Um, what was sad about it, however, is the pandemic. Um, as I don't have to tell you, um, the advent of COVID-19 prevented this show not only from opening on time, but from being open to a good portion of the public for much of its run. It closes in March. Um, it also prevented the artists from coming back from the opening and taking part in a round table. Um, we tried to get something going on Zoom and unfortunately with a group of octogenarians, it just didn't really work out very effectively. So I'm afraid it's, it's not gonna happen. Um, one of the ways that we solved that was to take a Matterport tour of the exhibition and place it online. And if you go to the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Arts webpage, you can take that Matterport tour of the exhibit uh, to see uh, not only the works included, but um, their arrangement within the show um, and uh, also read the label, which often explains not only about the objects, but their context. Uh, because one of the things that is very, of, uh, very much of interest to me is how these objects spoke to each other within the context of the exhibit. So I have gone way too long and I apologize greatly to all of you for that. Um, I've had to kind of truncate some of my comments here at the end. So thank you so much. I hope uh, this was at the very least entertaining to all of you, and uh, I really do appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark. Um, virtual applause is being heard all over <laughs> the internet. Um, 
I invite everyone to type questions into the chat in YouTube. And um, I will uh, um, read them to Dr. White, read them to Mark. Um, I'll have a few questions of my own uh, as well. Uh, I do want to mention, Mark, that uh, Randy Griffey is is uh, with us virtually and sends Yay, his Randy. massive congratulations, <laughs> newish directorship and the alumni award. And of course, Randy uh, also has been honored with the Murphy Distinguished Alumni Award. So you're in excellent company. Um, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, obviously, you uh, you spent a lot of time with these artists. You know, talked with them quite a bit. Um, to what degree was this an oral history project as well as an exhibition project? Did you record interviews with them or document these conversations in ways that may leave a historical record on their own? Yeah, that's a very good question, David. And um, the short answer is yes. So um, I did that in two ways. So there is a catalog that accompanies the exhibition um, and that includes the transcript of an audio interview that I did specifically with Ed, Joe, and Jerry in Ed's studio. And it is almost an entire transcription of that discussion. Um, very little hit the cutting room floor. Um, I do also have an audio of that, so it is preserved for posterity. In addition to that, um, Pat, who now lives in Cape Cod, was asked to write a short essay, autobiographical essay. Paul was also asked to do one, and Mason also contributed. So actually, all of the artists not only feature in the exhibition, but they feature in the catalog in very uh, personal ways. In addition to that, um, a lot of my research, which was built up on conversations with all six of them, is represented in my essay in the catalog, um, which seeks to find those commonalities between all six artists. So there is a lot of primary research that was done um, for the project. Yeah. Um, is the show traveling or is Oklahoma the only venue? This is the only venue. Um, I think, and that's probably my fault um, because as I, the project was a, was a five-year project, but its terminus was probably poorly timed, not only because of the pandemic, but also because I was in a professional transition at that time. And so any ideas that we had about traveling the show kind of evaporated. The one thing I will say is that it is intended to be um, a component of uh, working in tandem with a show at Oklahoma Contemporary that focuses just on Ed Ruscha. And that exhibit just opened last week, I believe. So they overlap just a bit, but there is a kind of general celebration um, of Ed's career and the careers of the other five guys happening in Oklahoma City right now. And I think at the end of the month, I'm supposed to be part of a round table that will include Oklahoma Contemporary, as well as the mayors of Los Angeles and Kansas and uh, Oklahoma City, sorry. So, um, you know, I mean, there is this kind of, of, of boosterism, I think that has gone along with this project. So um, has there been interest in Los Angeles in this show? Has it sort of made ripples over to the West Coast? It did as a lot more early on than it has now. Um, originally, especially when we were going to have the round table with all six guys, um, we were going to work with Cal Arts. We were working with several of the prominent galleries in Los Angeles. Um, and all of that, once again, kind of evaporated. Um, you know, we had, we had some uh, projects that were going with Gagosian, with Cone Gallery, um, with many of the galleries that represent these guys. And it was kind of sad to see all of that disappear. Yeah. But have, have people been able to see it in Oklahoma and, and, and has there been a, a good response down there from what you can tell? It has been very well for, received from what I am told. Um, I, we have a number of, I've only been back to see it once. Um, there is on the website a tour that Paul Ruscha and I give as well as a Zoom that uh, a Zoom talk that we gave to talk about uh, the exhibit. And Pat Blackwell actually was able to join and chime in on that. So there's, there's quite a bit of virtual um, 
programming that is also available if you can't get to Oklahoma or if you can't get to Norman. Um, but yeah, their numbers, I mean, to be honest, their numbers have been low for obvious reasons, but everybody that's coming in the door is coming to see that show. Right, so. right. So here's a question from um, one of our doctoral students, Maggie Vaughn. Did the artists that you worked with recognize Oklahoma as an influence on their art practices? And if, if so, in what ways? Great question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, they certainly did. Um, and that was, that was kind of what began this discussion is that um, most of the guys recognized that Oklahoma had not played a major figure or major role in the scholarship on their respective careers. Cool. You know, that there had been obvious references to it, but there's still even today a lot of people who don't recognize that Ed Ruscha calls Oklahoma his boyhood home. Yeah. Um, people who should know better, in fact. So um, that was part of the project was, was to bring out those connections that they felt had always been ignored. Um, and one of the ways in which I worked with them was to bring out those, those childhood stories, um, to talk to them about their experiences in Oklahoma City, their experiences going to the same high school, um, and how they see the state today. Um, and they have, you know, it's, it's, I'll be honest about this. They have, they have kind of the same relationship that I have with Oklahoma. There's sort of a love hate relationship on one hand, you know, there's this sort of love for the place that you grew up and an appreciation for what is a value there, but then, you know, also a kind of real abhorrence to what you find to be uh, wrong with it. Like for me, for instance, it's the politics of Oklahoma, the dominance of the um, evangelicals, which, by the way, is the same thing that many of them had problems with. Um, you know, the, they all point, like I would, to the dominance of the Southern Baptist Church and its influence beyond the church on, on Oklahoma culture. So, right. Another question, have any of the six artists continued to collaborate? Yes, and that's one of the things that you see in the show is just about every one of those objects was not created in isolation. They were almost always created in dialogue with one of the others. So um, there are physical collaborations, like there's a painting that both Ed and Joe collaborated on. There are Jerry's photographs, which are almost always portraits of one of his friends. Um, but there are also more thematic and conceptual um, collaborations between them. Um, for instance, one of my favorite objects in the show is a portrait that Ed did of Joe Good, and it says Joe, and it's got a picture of a spark plug, very similar to Bacabia's yeah. um, well-known object. And it, it actually, it, it sort of bleeds out in numerous ways. Well, Ed painted that because Joe was interested in cars too, but Joe was also working at a garage at the time and often working on Ed's cars. In addition to that, um, Joe had done a pinup calendar of Southern California artists called Artists in Their Cars or something like that, where instead of scantily clad female models, you have the male artist posing next to their cars. So it's, it's, those are the kinds of inside stories that sort of bleed out and become these kind of thematic collaborations. Here's another question from one of our graduate students, Kat White, who says, thank you for sharing this project. It seems the virtual tour was a good solution to issues brought by the pandemic. How did the pandemic affect your understanding of accessibility of exhibitions? Thank you for that question, because that's something that I'm, I'm still very much thinking about um, in New Mexico. Um, so, you know, when I left Oklahoma, this project was, I think, scheduled to open about two months um, after I left. And in those early days of COVID, we were still thinking, okay, well, you know, maybe this is all going to be over in the summer. We're all quarantining for a month. Nothing's happening. Hopefully this is all going to go away. Of course, now we know that that didn't happen. 
but um, that was our hope at the time. And um, as it became clear that not only was the exhibit going to be postponed, but we would have to think about alternative ways to get information out, we began using tools like Zoom, for instance, uh, to think through programs, um, Matterport to offer a virtual tour, um, and additional ways that we could think about accessibility. And initially those ideas were, well, you know, just how do we salvage this project? How do we make it um, available in some form? Ideally, you want everybody to come and see the works in person, just like, you know, you want your students to get out of the classroom and see the works in person. You know, the, the slide or the PowerPoint is a poor substitute. Well, a Matterport is also a poor substitute, but it does have a useful function. And since that time, we have really seen these tools as a useful form of outreach, especially, and I, I, I'm gonna have to shift the question a little bit to what I'm doing in New Mexico, because for us, you know, we are the state museum, the state art museum of New Mexico. We're based in Santa Fe in Northern New Mexico, but New Mexico is a large state and there are a lot of rural communities. How do we serve the population of the entire state? Well, Matterport tours are one of those ways that we can do that. It allows teachers to use that content in their classrooms. It allows for people at, in rural libraries where that may be the most dependable internet access for miles to also access that content. And so even if it's a poor substitute for the actual work, the Matterport creates an accessibility that I consider to be vital and something that informs my reason for going back into museums in the first place. I got out of academia after eight years, after being tenured, because I wanted to have more interaction with the public. I wanted to feel like I was making a difference with the public at large, not in the classroom. And I felt like the scholarship that I was producing in academia, the way I was teaching work in the classroom wasn't satisfying to me. And that's not to, to, that's not to discount it in, in other forms, but for me, I wanted to do something else. And so I went back into museums because I felt an exhibition, an exhibition catalog could have the kind of outreach that I didn't feel I could get in the classroom. And so these are for me an extension of that desire to reach more people because ultimately if art history is going to have any utility in our society, it has to go beyond art historians. You know, you can't just write for your colleagues. You've got to at some level write for everyone. And that's why they're, that's how they're going to know the value of culture, the value of social ideas, political ideas, philosophical ideas. So, sorry, I've gotten up on a soapbox, <laughs> but um, you probably didn't know that when you asked me this question that I was going to go off in this direction. But your question about accessibility is, is a really important one. And it is something that we as museums are very much struggling with right now. And the solutions that we've got are good first steps, but we're going to have to do a lot more. I hope that I answered the question and didn't dodge it. I think we maybe have time for one more question. This comes from another of our graduate students, Wei Tian Yan, who asks if you'd mind sharing uh, another story or two uh, that you enjoyed the most when you were working with these artists in person. Any <laughs> answers that you haven't already that, shared? That's a, that's a tough one because um, I've, I've got so many. Um, so, okay, I'm going to share a couple, um, some of them more interesting than others, but, um, it'll kind of give you a perspective on getting to know these guys. So for instance, um, going to Ed's studio, you never know what you're going to encounter there because Ed has a celebrated career and very early on, he very much integrated himself into Hollywood. Um, and so he's got a lot of friends and one day I was there, um, and I had just had lunch with Paul and with, um, one of his other, um, assistants and, uh, he walks in with, um, with this, this friend of his, this, and the, the woman, 
um, is very friendly. And Ed says, um, Candy, I want you to meet Mark White. Mark's from Norman. And so she shakes my hand and, and we're talking and I recognize her voice. And I think, wow, you know, I, I know who she is, the way she moves her mouth, the, her, her, her gestures. And she walks away. And then Susan, one of his assistants says, you know, you know who that is? And I said, well, I think that's Candy Clark. Now, for those of you who don't necessarily know Candy Clark, Candy Clark is an actress. She got her start in um, um, American Graffiti. Hmm. And um, she's, she's got the pink hair in American Graffiti. She goes on to be uh, to star with David Bowie and The Man Who Fell to Earth. And, um, but she was originally from Norman. Uh, and so that's kind of interesting. Um, but let me think if I can think of another really good anecdote um, right off the top of my head. Um, oh, oh, here's one. <laughs> okay, so Ed and Mason used to go on what they called Dada dates. And so they would take their date and do something deliberately absurd with that date to see if, the, if whoever they were dating had the stuff to actually be with them. So Mason decides at one point he's on a date with the actress Connie Stevens and he decides before they even get there that they're going to have their date in a tree. So Connie in the 1960s dresses up in a dress. She's got pantyhose on. She looks really nice. And then Mason proceeds to ask her to climb up this tree where he's arranged for them to have dinner. Um, needless to say, she did go on a second date with Mason. <laughs> oh, great stories. Um, we, we really enjoyed your talk. We learned a lot from it. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of process of putting an exhibition like this together that obviously was a, a, a project that, that was very important to you and very meaningful for the artist that has to be a, a very rewarding professional experience for you. I'm sure it was bittersweet to sort of have it open, you know, after you had moved to New Mexico and, you know, then the pandemic on top of all that. So, we wish you the best in your, your new position. We all have uh, uh, extra reason now to come to Santa Fe. And uh, once this pandemic is over, you, 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 you will certainly see me out there. Please come, all of you come as soon as it's safe to do so. I'll take you to great restaurants. Um, and we've got a new contemporary museum opening in 22, so. Excellent, excellent. So before we sign off, I wanna remind everyone that um, this is the first of a double header. There's another lecture tonight on our YouTube channel at seven. Dr. Anna Arabindan Kesson uh, will be speaking on seeing through empire, medicalizing vision, imagining space. That's the keynote lecture for the History of Art Graduate Student Symposium that um, is starting tonight and then um, going on the next two nights. So you can find more information about that on, on our website. So again, let's have a virtual round of applause for Dr. Mark Andrew White, our Murphy Distinguished Alumni Lecturer for 2020, 21. Mark, sorry you couldn't be with us in person, but um, we'll have you back here in person some other time. <laughs>